All right, folks, we'll give it another minute or so and, and get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're really excited to welcome you to today's Physician Scientist 101 for community college students. Uh, my name is Brie Christopher, is pronoun she. I am a fifth year MD PhD student, and I serve as co chair of the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, JEDI, uh, for the American Physician Scientist Association, APSA. And um, we're glad to be reprising this event. We did it once last year, and um, we're hoping that people will get a lot out of it um, as folks did um, the last time we did it. Uh, the goal today is for y'all to learn a little bit more about uh, what is what it could be like to be a physician scientist, how you can do research and practice medicine, uh, or do any combination of those two. Um, and then we'll have our wonderful panelists talk to you about their experiences and why they decided to, to go down this path. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, feel free to put any questions or thoughts in um, either the Q&A box option or in the chat. We'll be looking at both um, throughout the next hour. And starting at seven, there'll be Kind of a subsequent session uh, that's more general audience uh, that'll feature people who are currently like practicing physician scientists and doing all sorts of things in their careers. So highly recommend that you stay on for that if you're able to. Okay, so first off, I'm going to share my screen here. Great. So I'm going to talk for a couple minutes on, you know, why being a physician scientist is awesome and how you can become one. Um, so again, this is to give you context about um, the many things um, that physician scientists can do and uh, things that, that you could do too. Um, so what is a physician scientist? Uh, physician scientists combine the roles of being a physician and a scientist. Uh, and we're defining scientists really broadly, right? These are people who do research. Um, and we'll talk about some fields in a moment. But being a physician scientist, you can do um, any combination of things that use your training, um, either medical training or research training. So this could look like treating patients uh, in the clinic, at the, at the hospital. You could re uh, lead your own research lab run clinical trials with patients. Um, there can be a component of mentoring or teaching, um, be it medical students or graduate students, residents. Um, and, you know, something else that, that some folks do is uh, kind of go into industry or develop medications, treatments, devices, come up with other ways um, that we can improve kind of the medical sphere. And this is not an all-inclusive list, right? People are finding many different ways uh, to use their training to, uh, to make the world better and uh, serve patients better. Um, as far as like logistics goes or becoming a physician scientist, there's not one way to do it. You could um, get a single degree, so do an MD or a DO. Um, or you can decide to do a dual degree program. So one example of that is doing an MD PhD or a DO PhD. Um, and like I said, being a scientist is really broad, right? You could do research in something that's more of uh, kind of the traditional basic sciences, cell biology, neuroscience, cancer research. Then there's folks who are in the social sciences doing things like anthropology or epidemiology, public health. Um, 
and then other folks who um, their kind of sphere of expertise is um, more in the clinical or translational science space. So how do we make um, treatment better? How do we um, how do we get these things into the clinic um, and um, work with, you know, directly with patients? Next. Um, so I'll focus a bit on what it's like to do an MD PhD or a DO PhD, uh, just because I think that's a, a topic that's a little more unfamiliar to folks. But like I said, you could do an MD or DO and combine that with doing research in a variety of ways. Uh, but an MD PhD or a DO PhD, um, pursuing that, it, it could be done through a formalized uh, program where you complete both degrees. Um, and, you know, why would you want to do something that's going to take a really long time? And we'll talk a minute about what that could look like as far as timing. Uh, but it gives you a special opportunity to get rigorous medical and, and research training um, and apply those things um, to your ultimate career as a physician scientist. Um, so to give you a sense of like what this what this path could look like if you, you know, starting off in community colleges, um, depending on how many years you're there, eventually you could transfer to a um, four-year institution, finish your, your undergraduate training. Um, you may or may not choose to take other years in between before starting uh, a program. So um, on average, MD, PhD, or DO, PhD programs take about eight years. Some people it's a little less, some people it's a little more, it just depends. Um, on how your research goes and, and the rest of the things you have to complete for, for both degrees. And there's no kind of one size fits all approach to this, right? There's multiple ways um, to, uh, or multiple orders that, that you can do some of the training before um, doing a dual degree. Um, and as I mentioned, you could decide to do the single degree and still pursue research as part of your career. Um, by getting that training during medical school or as a resident physician after you finish training um, and ultimately um, have that as your career. Although um, getting that research training, um, you usually will have to spend about the same amount of time, even if you decide to do a four-year uh, clinical degree um, by getting your research training during residency or fellowship or while you're practicing physician. So if you're daunted by kind of the long, <laughs> the long path, you, you know, um, there is, uh, everything gets done in whatever way you want it to happen. So something to consider. Uh, when we think about maybe not pros and cons, but, uh, just considerations that you should have when deciding, you know, what path um, to do. Uh, if you go the single degree route and choose to do research, you know, there is that shorter clinical training time up front and you would go straight into clinical training, into residency, if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, some caveats, right? Um, research training time is uh, not as well-defined as if you decide to do a PhD, go to graduate school in the middle. Um, you still have to pay for medical school somehow. Um, so there's the loans consideration there um, to pay for, for that training. Um, and um, on the other hand, if you decide to do an MD, PhD or a DO, PhD, um, for the most part, your training is covered financially, um, be it tuition, fees, insurance, uh, stipend, depends where, where you end up, uh, what combination of those things you receive. Um, you get kind of specified rigorous training in research uh, during uh, those PhD years. Um, and some people consider it to be more competitive if you wanna pursue research moving forward, um, kind of in your postgraduate career. Although again, it depends what field you end up in and what kind of research you wanna be doing. Um, and as we, you know, as I already said, it, it can take a while to finish the actual training program. Uh, some people may choose to, to use one of their, kind of the scope of one of their degrees more than the other or completely one versus the other. Um, and it can be a challenge to constantly be flipping between different um, 
modes of learning, right, from medical school to uh, doing your PhD and then coming back to finish medical school, which is um, the timeline I think that most programs go by um, at this point. Um, as far as getting involved in research um, now before um, applying or pursuing an MD-PhD, um, it's always a good idea to get started as early as you can, and that um, can look a variety of ways. Um, you could try to find someone at nearby institutions to work with uh, or try to do a summer research program. Uh, APSA has some resources for, for finding out about those kinds of opportunities in addition to running its own virtual summer research program, uh, which community college students uh, qualify for. So there's that. Um, you might decide to take time after graduation um, and do research at that point. Um, so again, different ways uh, depending on what your goals are and um, what your life looks like. Um, just like a brief note about logistics, uh, you can learn a lot more about applying to med school or MD-PhD programs through APSA's interactive series sessions, which like very much focus on, on that part. Um, but just so you have a sense, uh, it's a very similar process to applying to medical school. There's, um, it's the same application if you're applying to um, MD programs or DO programs for DO PhD pro um, programs. But one of the big uh, things that you have to emphasize is your research experience and why you wanna move forward uh, training as a physician scientist and articulating that throughout the application. As far as the other requirements, they're fairly similar. There's a lot of courses that, that you have to check off as prerequisites, uh, completing the MCAT standardized exam, in addition to other kind of extracurricular activities and having people talk about why, why you should be a physician or a physician scientist. That's enough from me, because the more important part of this uh, you know, event is hearing from folks who started off where you are. Um, and we're very grateful for our three uh, panelists today, Danielle, Britt, and Anthony. Um, and, you know, this is y'all's time to um, talk about your experiences and answer questions from folks in the audience um, about what this path has looked like for you. And I'll leave it up to you guys to introduce yourself, um, however you see fit. But why don't we start with Danielle? Uh, let me stop sharing, sorry. Thanks so much for... Um... The introduction and um, the slides are great. I think they're really helpful. Um, so my name is Danielle Sawyer. I am a fourth year MD PhD at the University of Arizona. Um, I don't know if I should introduce more, but um, I went to community college at Santa Rosa Junior College for about five years, attended two years at university, and then took two gap years before um, being accepted into um, MD PhD program here. Um, I guess I can go next. Great. Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. So Danielle is my classmate. We're in the same cohort at the University of Arizona, which I think is really cool. Um, we bounce a lot of ideas off each other and have written articles about like being community college alums and such. Um, so yeah, my name is Britt. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I'm in the neuroscience program at the University of Arizona. So I was also in community college for, I think, five years total. I was like a joint a uh, student for a while between Portland Community College and Portland State University. So I um, actually started organic chemistry at the university and then was like, oh, no, 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 I don't like this. And then took it at my community college and then passed the ACS and then I transferred as university credit. So there's all kinds of ways to like um, kind of check all the boxes you have to check. Um, so after I graduated, I think I took two and a half to three years um, as gap years, worked in a research lab and kind of like convinced myself that like, yes, research is something that I really love and that no matter like all the bad things that come with it, like the good things outweigh them. So like it was a really good experience. So I managed a lab for about two years um, and then I got into medical school my second try. So I'm a reapplicant too. Um, so I'm happy to talk to people. I'll put my email in the chat. Like I'm happy to talk to people about re reapplying and how to kind of um, show schools that like you 
put in an effort to like be super duper after like getting rejected. Um, I think that's it. Anthony, it's all you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony. I use he, him pronouns. I am a uh, third year MD, PhD student at Stony Brook University out on Long Island. Uh, and my PhD is going to be in biomedical engineering. Um, I did two years at community college. I transferred for two years and then I did two years at um, uh, of gap research before uh, joining the program here. So this is the first time I've done something in a three year chunk, which is a new feeling. Great. Um, why don't we start off with you all talking about, you know, when did you find out that a, you know, doing this sort of program or going on this path was a thing and how um, it informed uh, your like educational path? Yeah, so um, I don't think, I didn't even know MDPHB programs were a thing until um, I basically had an opportunity to work with a researcher at a local institution. Um, it was a private research institution near my community college. And a few students every year were selected for this opportunity to kind of, you know, gain some research, which is really unique for community colleges. A lot of community colleges don't have access to, you know, research opportunities. And in working um, at this research center, um, you know, the, the postdoc that I worked with you know, said, hey, you know, you know, I know you're all about, you know, going to medical school and that's great, but you know, you really like science. Like he could tell it was just so genuine for me. And I just loved, you know, doing research and being in the lab and answering these questions. It's like, you know, they, they do have MD PhD programs and kind of um, introduced me to the idea of the program. Um, when I transferred to Davis, I kept doing research, just thinking like, oh, do I really love it? Or is maybe it's just that one experience was fantastic. And, you know, I'm not gonna like other experiences because, you know, can't all be this great. And um, I continued to just enjoy, um, you know, doing research and, and answering these really cool questions. And um, I actually was met with a lot of um, pushback from uh, faculty and professors that were PhDs saying, you know, you can't do it all. You can't, you know, have two really, um, you know, really, I guess, massive careers and be successful at both. And, um, you know, so I, I was really unsure and really hesitant. And, um, but I said, you know what, there's no harm in like, you know, applying and just, you know, seeing how it goes and seeing if it's a good fit for me. Um, so that's kind of what led me to my decision to apply to MD PhD programs. Um, I really did want to continue research, but also was so interested in helping um, patients and working directly with patients. Um, I think it's such a privilege to be able to do that too. So um, that's what brought me here. I don't have much of a cool story like that. I think I was, I think I was in the middle of enrolling for university, like as a co-enrolled student at community college. And then I like found out on the website of a med school that there was something called an MD PhD program. And like, from the time that I started community college, I thought I always had to choose and I really liked science, and I, but I really wanted to go to med school. So like, I was always kind of debating with myself, like, which one do I want to do? Like, which one I'll be happy doing? And I could never figure it out. And then I found out there were programs that did both. So I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. Um, so that's, that's what kind of steered me towards it. Like at that midway point, like after maybe two years of community college, when I discovered it and I was like, that sounds like exactly what I want to do. Like I want to be a PI, but I also want to see patients. So like, that's kind of my goal still. Um, yeah, and I, there are a lot of people, there's kind of like a, a weird, it's almost, I don't want to call it a stigma, but it kind of is where like from the MD side, they kind of like have a weird attitude about PhDs and on the PhD side, they have a weird attitude about MDs. And so like, you kind of get the, the worst of both than you're both, um, but it's really, it's really fulfilling to kind of occupy both those spaces. So. I'm, I'm happy dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I would say I wandered around for a bit. Uh, so 
for background, I was homeschooled K through 12. Um, and I wasn't really sure if I was going to like being in a classroom. So that's kind of why I uh, started off at community college, because it was very near my parents. And I was like, you know, let's see if, you know, higher education is something that is going to uh, mesh well here. Um, and I really didn't like biology going in. I thought I wanted to do computer science. Um, and what happened was that there was a very strong nursing program at um, my community college. And I wound up taking bio classes uh, that were more human anatomy than actual bio to fulfill my credits because I just really didn't want to go back to cell bio. And one of the professors there who was teaching was very encouraging that, you know, oh, you know, if you continue in biology now, research is all math. So you would be happy doing this kind of work. Um, so it's just something to think about as you go forward. So I, when I wound up transferring, I wound up um, transferring as a biomedical engineering major instead of uh, just straight electrical engineering like I had originally thought. Um, and there I started doing a, a neuroscience research and it kind of wound up being that along the way I thought, oh, you know, I really like the theory that I'm doing, but I'm losing touch with any kind of human application. So that's what sort of made me start thinking about uh, the MD and it just kind of coalesced over time as I just sought out more clinical experience that yes, this was something I wanted to keep up and that would free me up to do more theory work during my PhD. So, you know, and then I kind of ended up here. Um, could y'all talk uh, a little more about, um, I don't know, finding your first research experience, what you did during that first research experience. And um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's the end of the question. Yeah, sure. Um, so my first research experience, I kind of mentioned, um, it was, I was really fortunate that my community college partnered with this local research institute. Um, and essentially you had to apply for the position and they, they picked students um, to be able to have that research experience. So I was really lucky. That was kind of my first introduction to research. Um, I was originally just a pre-med student and all pre-meds kind of are told you need to do some research um, if you're going to apply to medical school. So for me, I didn't look at it as much as, oh, I, I really am interested in research. For me, it was more of like, oh, I need to do this. But um, I worked at an aging research institute um, where we essentially studied um, genetic deletions that uh, result in either an increase in lifespan or a decrease in lifespan um, using yeast as our um, and C. elegans as our model. Um, and it was just really cool. I think the field of aging is so interesting because it has such, um, you know, even for somebody that's like a novel, <laughs> or, um, you know, novel scientists, it has, it's so easy to understand the implications of the research. And I think, um, you know, having that translational aspect early on, I think probably was important for me to kind of consider, you know, research as a career. Um, so that was my first research experience. My second experience was at UC Davis, where um, I completed my bachelor's degree. And um, I studied microtubule and microtubule associated proteins um, and kind of how they regulate um, cellular transport or trafficking within the cell. Um, and specifically how these, um, you know, and we think of them kind of as like road sign um, type uh, proteins that kind of say, turn left here, go straight here, here's the exit, you know, for this, this street. Um, kind of how these additional proteins are regulating that transport. And um, it was a lot of, you know, really intense biochemical work. Um, and I ended up doing it the summer after I graduated as well. Um, and ended up resulting in a publication, which is really cool to be a part of, you know, a publication process and, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, I loved all of the research so much, it made me question whether or not I really wanted to pursue an MD PhD versus just a PhD. So I ended up doing some um, clinical work as a medical scribe during my gap years. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my research background and history right now. Um, I used to study DNA damage and repair um, at the Cancer Center um, here at the U of A. 
So for me, my first research experience, I think, was my senior year in university. So um, I had some like health issues and a brain injury and was like, there's no way I'm going to do very well in a lab like when I'm dealing with all this stuff. So I kind of delayed starting doing research until my senior year, and it was actually really not a bad thing. Um, so I worked in a lab that studied extremophile viruses. So I'm really interested in neuroscience, but I also really love viruses and molecular biology. And my university didn't have a neuroscience department, so we all kind of scrapped together our own curriculum and like had a neuroscience club and kind of like built our own kind of major out of it. Um, so the very first lab I joined was like very very cool biology lab where we actually went and did like field work so we would go and actually scoop viruses out of hot springs and like acidic goo and like really cool like really cool like mountain environments and we went camping together and then our car broke down so we camped longer and like it was really fun um so even though i, I guess I, I would say i had like a later research experience um it was still like super fulfilling and definitely worth doing and then after that um I think it took about a year for me to get a lab job that was like a legit like salary job with like health benefits, which was really cool because I never had that before. Um, and then I studied nephrology and hypertension and used, you know, like uh, human cells and mice. So very different from like extremophile archaea that you find only one place in the world. But um, it was really cool to kind of go at it with such a broad um a broad range of experiences like working with archaea and cells and mice was really an interesting it had a lot of interesting like interview potential like when i was interviewing for med schools people just asking like what is an archaea and like getting to geek out about them was was very fun um so i know that like a lot of people stress getting an early experience but it's not not totally the end of the world if you don't so don't worry about it um and then now i study um pharmacology specifically chaperone protein inhibitors and Alzheimer's disease. So I'm doing a bunch of really cool pilot experiments right now. Um, yep, that's me. I would echo that. You don't really need to stress if you haven't started research. Uh, I did zero research uh, during my community college years um, just because nobody really did it around there. Um, I did do like, you know, engineering projects, but those are not the same at all. And then my first uh, research job was actually a work study job in art history. So not also completely unrelated to science. And there are very few uh, MD, PhD programs that would ever let you do that as a PhD, although not impossible. Um, and then sometime around the end of my first semester after transferring, there was a research fair where there were some PIs who were looking for um, people interested in their projects. And there was a cool project in neuroimaging and psychiatry that I was like, oh, you know, I have the programming background. I could totally do that. And it just kind of went from there. I would stuck with that for the rest of my time in undergrad and then actually joined a related lab for my uh, full-time research afterwards. How did you all go about um, navigating um completing you know all the requirements uh, or like academic requirements um needed to apply for for med school right you know having attended various institutions um yeah making sure you check off those boxes that you inevitably have to sorry um, I would say, <laughs> sorry, my cat is hanging out with us today too. Um, <laughs> I would say um, that, you know, I was really, I really had a hard time, um, you know, figuring out, you know, how to be successful as an applicant applying to medical school, much less an MD, PhD program. Um, I was really fortunate um, that faculty at my community college really connected me with um, students that were a little bit ahead of me in similar processes. Um, I had one um, colleague and friend that um, uh, successfully applied in and got into a DO program. And um, I had another colleague that applied to PhD programs and they just kind of, you know, gave me all of the advice that they had based on their own experiences. Um, and I think it was kind of a um, hodgepodge of different, you know, pieces of advice. And I just had to take what was useful and forget what wasn't. 
Um, but I think it was really challenging. And to anyone out there that's considering this path, like I know it's really overwhelming and challenging. Um, so don't get discouraged. Um, but I really leaned on um, mentors and colleagues that were ahead of me in the process. Um, and I think, you know, since since going through this process, I got so, you know, fired up, like, why is this so hard? And why don't I understand what you need to do? And I ended up giving, getting really heavily involved with the admissions teams at um, the College of Medicine, as well as the MSTP program, um, so that I could really help mentor other students, um, especially community college students, because I know it's so hard and so challenging. So. Like I would say maybe one of the hardest parts for me was financially. So like as I moved forward, as I was like, okay, I'm going to apply for the MD-PhD program. I have to get research experience. I have to get clinical experience. I have to get this and that. It's like it started with like one more roommate like living in the living room. We turned into a living bedroom with like a curtain. And then it turned into like two more roommates. And then like we literally like had to penny pinch everything. Like I lived on rice and beans for like way too long and just like you know, having like no family support, having like very low income background and trying to like satisfy all of these requirements was really, really hard. But I think that if you know you really want it, it's going to, it's going to pay off later. Like it will show like all of the penny pinching you have to do, all of the sacrifices you have to make, like when you're getting interviewed, like that will come out. Like they'll totally see that like, okay, this person is like pretty intense and serious that they want to do this versus like someone who just, you know, like applied on a whim and didn't really think about it or something like that, or who had opportunities that they didn't really have to fight for. Like, there's definitely like a difference. Um, and I also work in admissions too, like Danielle, like our school is really cool in that it lets students be pretty heavily involved in admissions. So like, you know, like the difference of interviewing someone who kind of is just like curious versus someone who absolutely knows that they want to do it is like very, very obvious. Um, and I guess in a weird way, I kind of feel lucky that I was rejected the first time I applied. So I applied like fresh out of fresh out of graduating for my bachelor's. And it was kind of nice that I had some extra time to like work on publications. So like my undergrad research experiences, even though I really liked them and I had a lot of fun, like I just didn't um, like I didn't have any publications like they're just it was a much slower pace working with extremophile viruses than like if you work with like mice or like biological, like a human biology kind of translational stuff. So like the, the time points of like when you start an experiment, when you publish is like way different depending on the field you're in. So just being able to talk about those experiences, um, even though I didn't have a publication and like just being able to like present at local research conferences and stuff that really helped. Um, but I guess, I guess I'm just trying to say like, if you're stubborn enough, you can definitely get there. And like, even though it really sucks, like at some points, if we have like similar backgrounds and it sucks for you, it's not gonna suck forever. And it's always going to be temporary. And eventually you'll look back and say like, how did I survive undergrad? Like sometimes I'll scroll my Google calendar like too far. Like it'll go to like 2015 or something. I'll be like, oh my God, like, what was I doing? How was I like going to four different places every day and like working two jobs and going to classes and, um, when it's when you finally get to med school, I wouldn't say it's easier, but I would say that um, once you have like dedicated time and you're not like completely getting ripped apart by like balancing different jobs and all those things, um, it's a lot easier to study when you are like stable. And like one thing I like about the MD PhD program um, is that tuition is not something to worry about. Finances are not something that you have to worry about nearly as much. So, um, yeah. Just be stubborn, stay stubborn. I like that be stubborn uh, approach to things. Um, uh, in terms of like fulfilling the requirements for me, I uh, was very lucky in that when I transferred, we had uh, an insanely strong pre-med, um, pre-professional advising committee. Uh, so really when I was sure that I was going to be like looking at this path, I sat down with them and they kind of like helped me map out like what my remaining courses were. Um, I would echo that I kind of wish I had, uh, thought about taking organic chemistry before transferring because it was 
much harder doing it with someone who does research in organic chemistry than with someone who enjoys teaching, uh, which I would say was the case at my community college. Like they were much more focused on teaching than um, the abstract concepts. So you can think about that um, a little bit, but at the end of the day, uh, really as long as like you hit the check boxes in some way, shape or form, um, you know, you'll have a decent shot. I think a lot of committees approach this more holistically now too, where your background in research and your motivation are important. Like not to downplay grades, but you know, once you're above a threshold, then that's that's all that they're there for. Um, there's a question in here about uh, transferring to a four-year institution, like what considerations went into that? Um, you know, whether it's a big research school, a private institution, like what were you looking at uh, and what were your considerations uh, when making that decision to transfer? Yeah, so I transferred um, from Santa Rosa Junior College to UC Davis. And um, out of high school, I always wanted to go to UC Davis. I kind of knew that's where I wanted to go. Um, I didn't know, uh, you know, after graduating high school, I didn't know that people, first of all, that they studied for the SAT or that <laughs> they applied to more than one college. You know, I thought, oh, I just want to go here. That's where I want to go. I'm going to apply there. Well, I applied to UC Davis and I didn't get in. And so I ended up um, attending community college um, because, especially because they had a transfer admission guarantee with the uh, with UC Davis, as well as a few other UC schools, um, which meant that all of the credits were transferable. Um, and as long as you got the minimum GPA, um, you were guaranteed acceptance as a transfer student, um, which was that's really was a huge reason why I selected UC Davis. Um, I did see, yeah, your question about, you know, maybe picking an institution that's more focused on research um, versus private schools. I know there are some private schools that partner with local institutions. Um, so I would, I would be shocked to find that the private school had zero access to research or research opportunities. Um, and I would say, um, Maybe that's one consideration, but I think that there are a lot of other, maybe more important considerations like your happiness and, you know, how long it's going to take you to graduate, the cost of your education going there, um, you know, the fit for you and what you want to major in. And, you know, like there's so many other things that I think if you want to find a research opportunity, there are so many ways to do so outside of just researching with that single institution. So I wouldn't make that decision maybe solely based on that information, personally. I would just echo that statement. Really, this is such a long path that you know, doing what makes you happy is what's paramount. And if you want to do this, you know, MD, PhD thing, you'll find ways to do that that don't conflict with, you know, what you really also want to be doing on, along the way. Yeah, also, like, if you go to, like, a very, maybe, like, a school that's very strict and you're burnt out from the second you graduate, I think that that's, like, really hard because... A lot, of, a lot of people say like med school is a marathon, not a sprint, but like the MD PhD program is like you're backpacking for like months in the middle of nowhere. Like it's like you are, you really have to be like self-sustaining. You have to find what brings you joy and you have to make sure that it doesn't like eat away at you because there are some, you know, like little pockets of lab cultures that are just awful. Like you will get yelled at, you will get demeaned. Like, and then there's others that are just perfect and they're fine and they're everyone's friends and they go out for lunch. And like, I've experienced like both of those um, and it really makes a difference. So honestly, I would just try to figure out which school, specifically the department, like the degree that you're interested in getting, like which one is more supportive because that's going to matter way more than like if you had a cooler research project or something. Like I feel like doing research when you're miserable is not as productive as you might think it would be. Like it definitely holds you back. 
even if you do a lot of cool research. If you're just, if it's just eating away at you, it's just not worth it. How do you all feel that starting off at a community college um, has informed your perspective either as a student or um, moving forward um, as a physician scientist uh, or as a physician in general? Um, um, I think that starting a community college taught me that like academia doesn't have to be terrible. So like my foundation is like, um, I, I was a work study library technician for like ever, like the whole time I was in community college and then worked in the community college library for I think nine years total, like after even after I graduated. Um, and just like having a sense of community and like stable like faculty that are always there to bounce ideas off of, like I'm still in touch with a lot of people from my community college and we're always like cheering each other on. A lot of my classmates are teachers now or um, they're also PhD students and it's very cool, but like, um, I think if I had started at university, I probably would have dropped out to be honest, because I had like no support going in and wasn't sure what to expect. And I think the community college kind of helped build these like supportive pillars for my career in a way. Um, or, like if something goes really wrong, like I have people that I can call on versus if I started at university and I'm in a class of like 200 people off the bat, like I don't think that I would like maybe made as close of connections to those professors. And also like it's kind of kind of instilled like this, this like desire to give back. So I really want to help community colleges have more research opportunities, more pre-med like tracks and more just more pre-med like opportunities overall. So that's something I really want to do in my career later. So, yeah, I probably wouldn't be in this program if I didn't start at community college, to be honest with you. Yeah, um, I would agree with um, a lot of what Britt said. Um, I think for me, um, I think community college really, like, was a time for me to, like, grow so much as a person. Um, I also felt really fortunate that I ended up not getting into Davis initially and staying home and going to community college in my hometown. Um, it meant that I got to spend more time with a sick family member of mine, um, which just was so like, I really believe that things are just meant to be sometimes, even if you're taking a different path or a different track. Um, and so I really feel like it was just exactly where I was meant to be. Um, and then, you know, community college was, for me, it was a lot harder than, you know, I transferred to UC Davis, which is a pretty good school, um, but community college was challenging. Um, and I think that it really gave me a strong foundation in science and a real, like, genuine interest, interest and passion for research and for really understanding what's going on and breaking it down. Um, and I think that was instrumental into pushing me towards a career um, in research um, and as a physician. Um, so I was, I feel really lucky and fortunate that I attended community college. I think it was fantastic for me. I would echo that. Um, I, I think that the folks who I met at community college were um, way more interesting in some ways. I think a lot of it just had to do with more lived experience. And also um, a lot of them were a lot more motivated as to why they were there and not just, you know, oh, I'm going to college because that's the next thing to do. Um, they had like a very strong reason of why they were there. And so I think that that was formative and helping shape and like how I approached like what I wanted to do next. And so, yeah, I would agree that I think community college was a great first choice. maybe a little bit of a, a pivot, but uh, what are y'all's clinical interests or how do you feel that intersects with, with the research work uh, you might do moving forward or are currently doing? Um, yeah, so um, my current research, I study DNA damage and repair um, pathways. Um, and specifically, I study a um, very small polymerase, DNA polymerase beta which is part of the base excision repair pathway. It repairs up to 50,000 base lesions per cell per day. So that is a massive repair capacity. 
and essentially I study different variants of this particular protein um, that exists within humans. And um, I'm working to understand whether or not these variants might predispose these individuals to cancer development. Um, so my focus, my PhD will be in cancer biology. Um, and I uh, hope to uh, at least go into internal medicine and probably hem hematology oncology fellowship following um, medical graduation. Um, so that's probably where I will end up, but um, I have kind of dabbled in the thought of radiation oncology um, perhaps, or, you know, I think for me, I think especially being a community college student and having, you know, a really strong sense of community, also being first generation and just, I don't know, really caring about like helping people and, and providing equity, you know, within the field of medicine. I think I have a strong pull towards also just doing maybe like internal medicine and, and being like, you know, um, more of a generalized practitioner that can help more, more wide scale. Um, so I think that's a pull I feel within me. Um, but yeah, we'll have to see where I end up. <laughs> Kind of similar here. Um, so I've always been interested in neuroscience and neurology, but sometimes like I feel a pull towards family medicine. I feel a pull towards internal medicine and just like being able to provide care for people in rural environments. And um, I, I kind of have an open mind though. Like I love pathology, like as a culture, like every pathologist you'll ever meet is the most wholesome person in the entire world. Like they will like make you hot chocolate. They'll like, give you cookies like they're just really nice in general and I think that pathology like in terms of culture is like very nice um and also like you could be a neuropathologist there aren't that many in the U.S. and it's like a very very needed specialty especially like uh with with our studies into CTE and like um football and traumatic brain injuries and things like that um I do feel a pull towards pathology but I think that like Maybe like my dream would be like being a nocturnal neurologist because like I have a sleep disorder and I have like a bunch of neurological disorders and I'm like oh that'd be kind of cool like because it always sucks to have to go to the doctor like seven or eight in the morning for neurology patients because like they can't sleep sometimes and like it's just awful but like what if I practice at like midnight that would be perfect for everybody because I'm like more nocturnal so I think about that a lot um so probably neurology maybe family med I don't know Uh, yeah, continuing with the I don't know train, I don't really know. Um, part of the issue, so I'm, my research is in neuro and it's all very computational uh, modeling in neuro. So it can pivot into a lot of different things. Um, and thankfully, you know, a lot of it is based on data that other people collect, which uh, makes it easier from a clinical perspective to, to like integrate, you know, like you can take data from collaborators and help that, uh, see how that interacts with your patients in different ways. So most likely something brain related. Um, I've always leaned more neuro, maybe neurosurge, uh, if I really want another seven years afterwards. Um, but I, I don't know about psychiatry yet. And the reason I don't know is because there's a very strong selection bias in how our psychiatry department was created for very well-adjusted people. So I always get along with the psychiatrists. My experience here sounds like with your experience with the pathologists, that they're all like super nice people. Like I can have a great conversation with them about anything. Um, so I don't know if I actually like psychiatry or I just like all the psychiatrists that I work with here. And that's something I, I think I have to wait till clinical to find out. We're moving closer to the end of this event. Uh, so I'm encouraging folks to put any other questions they have. Uh, but in the meantime, um, what do you think has been your favorite thing or most surprising thing uh, about your training so far? Um, I would say for me, um, I think it's been really cool and exciting to, you know, have basically maybe for people that don't know how the MD-PhD program is structured, I call it like a PhD sandwich. So you do the first two years of med school, then you do the PhD, and then you finish the last two years of med school. So I'm kind of like mid sandwich. I've already finished the first two years of medical school, which are all the clinical courses and, and whatnot. And I'm in my PhD 
I've completed all my PhD courses, but I think when I was in my PhD doing these courses, I think it was so cool to be in a classroom of people that had a completely different perspective than me. Their perspective was very research focused. A lot of them were PhD or master's students, and they kind of saw problems from a different perspective compared to maybe where I saw problems, which is like very clinical, you know, clinically focused. Um, and I think having that kind of epiphany of like, oh, it's really cool to kind of think about problems differently and be able to collaborate with people in, in a different way. Um, I think that's been really cool so far. I'm honestly still thinking because like there's a lot of like good surprises and a lot of bad surprises. Like so being a disabled person in med school and then trying to get accommodations for STEP was like a nightmare. And it's the same for like the MCAT. Like it's a very difficult to get accommodations. So like that was like a bad surprise, but the good surprise part of it is like you aren't alone. So like disabled medical students do exist. There's a lot of people who are managing chronic illnesses and also trying to study like a bajillion hours a day. And like it's definitely doable. And I feel like there isn't enough visibility because there's still a lot of stigma. But one thing that I'm like really excited about is like the increasing the increasing visibility um, and the increasing awareness like in medical schools of just like not being terrible and ableist all the time. Um, there's still like technical standards and things that say like, oh, if you can't hear or think a certain way, like you can't be a doctor. And that's like almost in every medical school's, you know, handbook for technical standards, which doesn't make any sense because there's plenty of people who have, you know, become deaf or lost their sight or whatever, like after they're done with their training and after they're done with residency and their physician's just fine. So I feel like there's like a weird filter process, but I think that I'm like starting to notice like the tears in that filter. Like I'm starting to notice like more of us are getting in and more of us are getting louder. So it's like really exciting. Although it's like kind of one of those things where it's like, it's also kind of a bad thing that it is that way, but it's like good that it's changing. So that's, that's one thing. I think overall, the thing that I'm most excited about um, has been, I feel really lucky that I enjoy most of the time what I get to do. Um, there's always some things that you're not going to enjoy along the way, but taking this path, there's, I would say a lot of the time, I'm very happy with the work that I get to do. Like it's all, it's challenging. It's something that I'm interested in. Uh, I get to learn new things. So I think it's been a great time that <laughs> I get to pursue things that keep me very engaged along the way. Great. Looks like the panelists for the next session are coming on. Um, so I want to take a moment and really thank Britt, Danielle, and Anthony uh, for their time today, for sharing their experiences starting off at community college and how that, uh, you know, has turned into where, where they are now. Um, I put a link in the chat um, for y'all to give us feedback and ideas of things you'd like to see uh, apps to work with. And I will hand it off to um, the folks who run the interactive sessions to uh, prep for the next event. Uh, I hope some of you guys stick around for that too. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Just let me know. All righty. So welcome to another one of APSA's interactive sessions of the 2021 through 2022 academic year. We are pleased to host tonight's session with Physician Scientists titled A Day in the Life of a Physician Scientist. I like, I'd now like to have our wonderful panelists go around and introduce themselves. Let's start off with Dr. Evan Nock. Hey, how's it going guys? I'm um, Evan Nock. I'm at Wild Cornell Medicine. I'm assistant professor of neurology and neuro-oncology. So I split my time seeing brain tumor patients, patients with neurological problems. And in the lab, I work on addressing uh, tumor metabolism through dietary and targeted therapies. Yeah, Dr. Na is an assistant professor with the Department of Neurology within the Division of Neuro Neuro-Oncology at Whale Cornell Medical College. And next we have Dr. Freddie Escorcia. Dr. Escorcia is an investigator and Alaska, um, at La and an Alaska clinical research scholar within the molecular imaging and radiation oncology at NCIS or NCI Center for Cancer Research. Would you like to introduce yourself? I think you you kind of already did. 
Um, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> sorry. So one of the uh, things that we focus on in the lab is uh, building targeted agents for imaging and therapy of human cancers. And I'm a radiation oncologist, which means I treat patients who have cancer uh, in the clinic. Thank you. Sweet. And last we have Dr. Elizabeth Felton. Dr. Felton is an assistant professor of neurology and biomedical engineering at the University of Wisconsin Medical School and Public Health. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Felton and um, I specialize in epilepsy and have interest in the ketogenic diet for the treatment of epilepsy and do clinical research around that. Thanks for having me. Of course. And thank you guys so much for taking the time out to be here with us. We are so grateful that you really took the time out to come virtually to meet and or to our meeting to provide your wisdom and pearls to folks thinking about what's due during their gap years. My name is Sophie and I'll be your moderator for this evening. I am a second year undergraduate student at Xavier University of Louisiana. And in the chat box helping us moderate, we have Monica who is our first year MSTP student at the University of Miami. And our volunteer live tweeting the event will be Fatima who is a recent graduate from Penn State University. And for those who are going to step away or miss a piece of it, as a reminder, we will have it recorded. And as a moderator, I will remind you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. We have already received those submissions during the registration process. And we have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes collecting questions live. You can submit the questions in the chat box. Okay, I think that's all the announcements we have. Thank you guys so much again for being here. And I'm gonna go ahead and start off with our first question. All right, so why did you decide to become a physician scientist? And what did that journey look like for you? You guys can choose who goes first. <laughs> All right, well, I can uh, can start with that. Uh, so I um, was at uh, NYU uh, for my undergraduate degree, and it was during my junior year that I was doing research in a laboratory after having done prior summers of research that uh, a postdoc in the lab uh, said to me, hey, in addition to applying for medical school, which I had planned to apply for, I should think about double degree programs. and as is probably happening to many of you, uh, although some of you are on this call, so hopefully you're aware of these, I didn't know that there were such things as MD, PhD programs. And so I said, you know, what's that? And they like, described it was a double degree program. And when I looked into them more in detail, I thought they sounded very appealing because I really liked the marriage of um, medical um, training. I shattered in clinics along with the research that I was doing. So I chose to apply to MD, PhD programs and then um, uh, went down to a Philadelphia to Temple. And while I was there, I really enjoyed going back and forth with the um, clinic and with the research that I was doing. And you know, not to take too long, but fast forwarding into uh, residency, I was in a research track and I really got to see what it was like to actually be in a clinic for half a day a week or a day a week and then go back to the lab and being able to uh, refresh yourself with both of those domains, I think is very helpful. So you get you can get frustrated in the lab with experiments that don't work and then you go and talk to patients and um, the personal encounter I think is very energizing to me but sometimes you have bad days in clinic where unfortunately in my world you're telling people they have brain tumors or even worse that their brain tumors come back and then you kind of get refreshed with talking about experiments in lab uh, which hopefully will go well <laughs> and um, and the questions from lab ultimately come from the clinic and that's the questions that I try to answer and so having both of those in my life allows me, I think, to be successful in both domains because I understand uh, some of the basic mechanisms of patients' uh, diseases that I treat. And then I can also uh, try to address those issues in lab. Sweet, thank you so much for that answer. Um, uh, Dr. Felton, would you like to go? Sure, so my journey to becoming a physician scientist was um, a little bit indirect. Uh, so I was not the person who, you know, knew I wanted to be a doctor since I was a child or anything like that. I did uh, my undergraduate in chemical engineering at Northwestern. And at the time I was more interested in research, although I, my special, my like specialization within chemical engineering was biomedical and like all the research that I did was sort of biomedical related. And so after undergrad, I worked for a couple of years. And during that time, 
Um, I volunteered in a hospital and this was just because I wanted to do that. It wasn't that I was like building up a resume for medical school or anything like that. And I really enjoyed that. And then um, I did go back to do um, initially a master's degree. And it was actually not until that point that I even heard about the MD PhD program. I, it was just something that either had been off my radar or hadn't been you know, exposed to before. And the research that I was working on um, was with a physician. And so I was like working with the physician in clinic and um, doing, uh, you know, the, the research that I was doing at that time. And it really just all came together. And I decided to apply for MD PhD programs. And so I did and ended up staying at the University of Wisconsin for that. And I did my PhD in biomedical engineering and um and then went on to uh, do a neurology residency and epilepsy fellowship. And I did some um, research during my residency and fellowship. And then now I'm, I'm on faculty at the University of Wisconsin, um, like, like I was saying earlier, kind of doing clinical research. And so um, the research that I did for my PhD is different than what I'm doing now, but that's okay. You know, the PhD is really a time to get those fundamental research skills nailed down and then, um, you know, you're kind of open to what you are doing in the future. And for me, being a physician scientist has been awesome because it's just, um, you know, like kind of like, you know, Dr. Noak was saying, like you you see a problem in the clinic and you have the tools uh, to be able to investigate that further in the lab. You can't, you know, it's not just like, oh, okay, like interesting observation or something like that. And so um, that's been really satisfying for me. Thank you for your answer. And Dr. Scorcia? I guess I'm up, right? Um, so I, I was kind of lucky. I discovered this path relatively early. I attended one of these panels where they had PhD students and MD, PhD students and MD students. And I was like, wait, what is going on? This combination degree deal. Uh, and I found this at, the, at, at a point in undergrad when I was a sophomore where I was really liking the science. I was like, cool, I'm set. Like, I want to go to med school. I want to help people. I like the science. I'm good. But then I was like, well, you know, I don't, what about this like research side? I'm liking the science a lot. I, you know, we always have to check that box as pre-meds and um, as a, little by little, I started liking it more. And then, you know, the fact that I didn't have to choose was appealing. <laughs> so like defer that, uh, that choice down the line and then, you know, see where, where it leads me. Cause at that point I really couldn't choose um, as in my uh, MD PhD program, uh, Evan and I went to the same uh, program. Um, so, uh, you know, I ended up um, focusing on cancer, uh, so that was, uh, that was of interest, and, um, and, you know, when I was done with the PhD, I had a great time, great mentor, great experience, I was kind of done, I was like, you know, I could take it or leave it, I would do it again in a heartbeat, but I could take it or leave it, and then I was a, as a third year med student, it was a first rotation on, uh, clinical rotation, and within a couple of weeks, um, I, I, I'm like asking questions to the residents. I'm like, hey, so like, how does this work? Like, why are we doing this? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And then everyone's looking at me as if I'm like a, a crazy person, you know, they're like, what's going on? Why, who is this weirdo? And, and I was like, oh, like I'm built differently here. Like, I, I wanna know the answers to these questions. Like, why are we doing this? Rather than like, no, this is what we do. Sometimes there's there's a role for that, but um, the, the, the why sort of uh, brought me back into the research side. So then as a resident, um, I, I pursued additional research uh, and, you know, still do it now. Thank you guys so much for your answers. That definitely is very enlightening for me, especially. So uh, what does a day-to-day -day look like and how much time do you spend with your patients versus in the lab? And if you want, we can go in the same order that we went in class. So. Okay, great. Uh, so right now I spend about 75% of my time doing research and the other 25% is split doing everything else. And, and the everything else as you get older becomes more things. So um, <laughs> it, it was uh, initially half a day a week of clinic, which uh, if you become um, a clinical um, clinician investigator is usually a full day. Um, so half day kind of spills over often with notes and administrative aspects. And then I also work with residents. So I uh, oversee a resident clinic a month. Uh, and then I um, consult on the wards uh, with uh, neuro-oncology cases and also general neurology cases. Um, and then from the educational perspective, um, there was an opportunity uh, at Weill Cornell to take over the leadership of the um, 
preclinical neuroscience, neurology, and psychiatry curriculum, uh, which is, as you uh, may know, if you're in this part of the training right now, is you know about in our in our case about eight weeks of neurology and psychiatry, and I lead the neurology aspect of that. So I organize the curriculum, I lecture, I organize the small groups, we work on quizzes, uh, and then we take you know student feedback, and that's a course in the fall. So um, you know I do a variety of different things in that 25 percent of the time. Um, but I think it allows me to pursue different interests and expertise uh, that I have um, in my current field. Um, so my breakdown currently is about 50% clinical and 50% everything else. Um, and so the clinical is um, broken up into a few different things. So one would be clinic where I see patients with epilepsy. And part of that is the ketogenic diet clinic that I run. Um, and that's, you know, kind of part of the research program as well. Um, I also have a women's epilepsy clinic where I see women with epilepsy during pregnancy. Um, I also do inpatient, uh, weeks during the year where I am, um, attending uh, for the epilepsy monitoring unit and reading EEGs. And I also do um, interoperative monitoring, which is uh, when patients are having certain types of brain and spine surgeries, I monitor their electrophysiologic signals to hopefully make sure they don't wake up with a deficit. So that's kind of the clinical component. And then um, I mentioned I do some clinical research. I also am associate director for our medical scientist training program here, as well as diversity officer for the Department of Neurology. So that's kind of, and you know, then lots of meetings, and I do you know a little bit of teaching here and there. I don't teach a course, but you know, giving lectures and things like that occasionally. Um, so you saw here, I'm solo parenting, my wife's traveling for work. So, you know, trying to juggle all the things, right? Um, so what is a day? Each day is different. Um, as you can imagine, um, I think it sort of depends on whether you're, you're doing it's a research day versus, um, a clinical day, uh, a clinical days. Um, I'm at the national institutes of health, uh, in the cancer, uh, national cancer Institute. So, um, it's a very select group of patients that comes our way. Everybody has to be on a clinical trial. So you don't often end up seeing patients that are early, earlier in their disease course. Um, so as a consequence, there's, there's not that uh, big a patient component to, to, to what I'm doing. Um, but on a given day, you know, I'll have patients scheduled, I'll see them, I'll talk to them about their cancer, I'll talk to them about the role of radiation for their cancer. Radiation um, is, is, is an important uh, treatment, one of the main treatments for, for cancers. And more than 50% of patients that get diagnosed with cancer will eventually see us. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it, it's either curative or it can be palliative, meaning that we help um, help them if there's, there's some symptoms as a consequence of their cancer. So help with pain, for example. Um, we used to have a residency program. We don't anymore. So I used to work with residents, but um, I, we do have some trainees that kind of uh, circle through. Uh, either medical students or post baccalaureate fellows that are, you know, looking to get some exposure prior to applying to uh, med school and things like that. Um, and then just dealing with consults. So we're typically outpatient. So there's inpatient and outpatient medicine. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some of the patients in the hospital, they may want us to evaluate them for radiation emergently because they're, they're having some symptoms now. Um, some other patients will be outpatient, so we'll schedule them in, in a couple of weeks, just make sure that there's nothing that needs to be addressed today. Um, and that's usually, let's say, like the clinical side. On the lab side, a uh, bunch of meetings with collaborators or my lab, my team, um, and trying to map out, troubleshoot experiments, what are the next steps. Um, so a lot of teaching and, 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 and learning from that. Um, and it's every, every day is different. It's, 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 it's kind of fun, actually. It kind of keeps it keeps you on your toes. And honestly, even every every meeting can be different uh, from a completely different collaborator. So I'll be talking about one per particular project where it's like all chemistry all the time. And I'm like, whoa, uh, the next meeting is like entirely clinical trial based. We're trying to like figure out how to improve patient recruitment. The next one is I'm talking to some undergrads that are interested in going to medical school. Right. So it's all over the place. And it, it can be it, keep, it keeps me keeps me interested, you know. <laughs> That is amazing how all of you guys are able to balance all of this and especially these two uh, different careers. It's amazing. But along those lines, we don't always succeed for the record. <laughs> 
I could just imagine that there'd be some sort of struggle, but you found the way. But um, yeah, along those lines, how do you guys handle the work life and the uh, or work and home life balance? And do you think that it's very challenging or was it a huge adjustment at all? Should we go in reverse order now or keep going in the same order? <laughs> sure, we can do reverse this time. <laughs> yeah, I did it. Okay. Okay. All right. So how do we do it? Um, I think it's one of these things where you have to choose which one you're going to be not as good at, right? Uh, you, you won't be able to succeed at all the things all at once. Um, so, you know, early on when you're, for us, for example, as faculty, right? Uh, when you're launching your research program, you have to invest a lot of time on that side. So you may not be as good, uh, uh, at least also speak for myself, you know, maybe, maybe uh, the rest of the panelists are, are, are much, much better than, than I am on this. So I ended up kind of holding off on building my clinical uh, uh, program until my lab was up and running. So right now we're at a point where the momentum's kind of going. I don't need to be there every day, for example, to make sure things are, are, are going okay. I have enough senior people that can sort of do the the day-to-day -day, uh, troubleshooting. Um, so now I'm trying to build our referral base for, for patients. So I can see more patients that, that have the particular um, illnesses that I'm interested in, in, in treating. Um, and then, you know, helping enroll in clinical trials, right? Um, so, you know, early on, I was a bet, not as good a clinician. Now I'm getting a little bit better clinician. Maybe I'm becoming a, a worse scientist all around the the, the, the day. Uh, I, I may be a, a worse or a better uh, dad and husband. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's sort of cycles, I think. Um, you, you, you can't be 100% for all the things, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, you know, I think like the terminology around this has kind of changed over the years. You know, it used to be called like work-life balance. Now it's like work-life integration. And um, I saw there was also a question in the chat related to this about, you know, how I've balanced being a physician scientist and a mom. Um, so I think that there's never a perfect balance and that it changes from day to day. Um, so maybe and, and weekend to weekend. So maybe one weekend I'm going to be, you know, attending all my kids sports and um, music activities. And the next weekend I'm going to do some work. And so, and it kind of goes back and forth, or maybe I'm going to bring my work to the sports activity, kind of, you know, watch and work at the same time. Um, you know, or like today, my kids were, there's a snow day here in Wisconsin. And so my kids were home from school. And so I worked from home. And so, you know, no, I was not in front of my computer the whole day, nor was I playing with them the whole day, you know, and so it's kind of like, um, a little bit of back and forth. And I think that, um, you know, there's just has never been kind of a perfect balance for me. I had my first child, um, my last year of residency and my second child, my last year of fellowship. And I started my faculty position with my youngest one was six weeks old. And so, um, you know, it's been, you know, that whole, my whole first year on faculty is a little bit of a blur, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, it's it's just about managing and doing the best you can and, um, you know, balancing priorities from day to day and it shifts and also having to be flexible, you know? So I kind of knew that there probably wasn't, we're gonna have school today, but sometimes unexpected things come up with the kids, they're sick or something like that. and. Um, you know, I have a very supportive partner as well, you know, who's able to help with the, the child care responsibilities. But, um, you know, I think it's just been um, over the years, just, uh, you know, kind of a, a give and take, you know, working on that integration um, and, uh, you know, realizing that it's, it's never going to be perfect and, and doing the best that I can in that day. Uh, yeah, I think that Balancing personal life and career is, is difficult, right? If anyone says these things, they're just lying to you. So uh, don't believe that. Um, I think one, I think you have to go into it with certain goals about how you're going to balance the two. Um, when I started a residency, uh, the first day uh, of internship, they gave us kind of a piece of paper and we had to write goals down for our year. And my goal was in New York City to like enjoy one thing that was New York City related once a week. So if it was like going to a restaurant, going to a show, walking through Central Park, just something that got me out of the hospital that I could enjoy. And so I think setting something concrete is important. 
uh, because then you can stick to those goals, something that's actually like achievable uh, and that uh, doesn't make you go crazy trying to balance those things. I also think that having a personal life is very important to keep you grounded. Obviously that's one way to protect against burnout, which is all over literature these days for many uh, career paths, including ours. Uh, and so, you know, uh, seeing friends or having a partner, having children, as difficult as it is, I think, brings you a lot of joy, just the same way like a good experiment or a good patient outcome brings you joy. Um, because when those things don't go well, then at least something in your personal life hopefully can go well. Um, so the way that you can actually achieve that and manage that, I think just like um, just like Elizabeth said, depends on uh, your support system. So build that support system early, You know, use your family, use your friends to keep you grounded and make sure that they're there when you don't have great days because there's gonna be those bad days. And, um, and also when you progress to different stages, so meeting a partner, having children, you have people there to help you uh, when, you know, for example, there's a snow day in Wisconsin and, uh, and you can't, you know, you can't be in lab or you can't be in clinic because you need to have uh, childcare or, you know, or Freddie's partner is not in town uh, and those things happen. And so you have to plan for those eventualities uh, because, you know, even if you have patients calling, you know, in a lot of cases, your family is is more important. So you need to um, have um, backup plans. Thank you so much for your answers. And that was such a great point to, you guys really try to find the optimism in all of this, which is definitely something I feel like a lot of uh, physicians that I've talked to seem to struggle with at times. But like you said, having a great family and a support system sounds like it'll bring you through it. But do you guys think, or do you guys ever feel behind your peers that only went to medical school? And do you feel as if you're more financially burdened because of it? Or do you feel as though your family plans were put on hold or hindered by the few extra years uh, between that? Are we going, am I, am I up, I guess? Um, all right, so there are a couple of embedded questions here. Um, what was the first one again? Sorry. Do I feel no, behind the MDs? Right. Do you feel clinically? behind the people yeah. that went straight there? Um, so, I mean, I, I think we all sort of um, encounter residency a little bit differently. Sort of depends. Um, so where, where I trained, it was very, very heavy clinical. But they also had re research, right? So they try to balance the two. But when you're clinical, you're all clinical. And you're, you're there with the folks that are MD and the, they, they want to go to private practice and this is what they're doing. They're going to be seeing patients. So they want to be as good at that as possible. So one of the things that allows you to sort of maintain that confidence on the clinical side is making sure that you get the appropriate clinical training. So then you don't feel like you're behind, right? What ends up happening later is that you specialize, right? So then you're, you're not having to be up to date with all of the things, but rather a, a, a subset of a subset of a thing. And that allows you to be an expert in the thing, even though you don't do it every single day, right? Um, and, and it allows you to sort of keep up. The other thing was debt, I think you were saying, or money, financial things, and then family things, right? Um, on the money side, I mean, MD, PhD programs are, are, are generally speaking covered stipend, right? So if your, your med school tuition is covered and your, your uh, grad school tuition is covered and you have a stipend. So you, you do come out debt free. Uh, I joke that we pay with our youth. So there is, it's not, there is, there is a cost, right? And everything is deferred, right? Um, you know, for, for uh, the reality is like biologically for, for me wasn't as big a consideration, but I know some of my uh, female colleagues have to take this into account, right? Because like, do you want to have sort of family during training? Because maybe there's a little bit more flexibility on the PhD side, for example. Um, and you have to take into account age, right? You know, unfortunately, that that, that, that that's something that, that you have to think about that I, I didn't, right? Um, it, it became an issue with, with my partner because she's a couple of years older than I am, right? So then we're like, oh, well, we got to have some kids now in residency. And there's never an easy time to have kids, okay, right? So you just got to do it and you roll with it just like other things and you try to make the best of it. And like Evan was saying, you, you sort of lean on the fam and friends. I'll just expand on a couple of those things. Um, so first on the financial, like was stated, um, the MSTP, if you go, if you go into a medical scientist training program, usually it's covered fully, you know, all expenses paid and you have a stipend to live on. 
your medical school colleagues typically are, you know, having to take out loans. Um, but then of course they finish sooner, right? So they are, they have their first, um, you know, sort of post-residency and or fellowship position um, sooner, you know, maybe four years sooner or some number of years sooner. And so that means they have those years of earning potential that, you know, are sort of ahead of you. However, when you have finished it, meaning if you do an MSTP program, you know, you're not in debt. Um, and so, you know, I don't know exactly how the math works out, but I feel like for me, psychologically, it was very nice to not be in debt at the end of that program um, at the, you know, sort of when I was done, um, even though people that I went to medical school who were in my medical school class, you know, were sort of, you know, making the big bucks, you know, you know, four or so years before I was. Um, and so I felt very comfortable with that situation. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about, you know, possibly, you know, the, the concept of, you know, having to delay, um, you know, having a family, I would say uh, there is no good time. And so you just have to do it when it's right for you. And I had gone to a talk, I think when I was in grad school, where there was a, a woman speaker who said that, that she had waited too long. She was like, oh, I'll wait till after med school, after grad school, after residency, after faculty, after I get tenure. And then finally, when she was at that point, um, then she wasn't able to conceive. And so she, her advice to, you know, us being, you know, was at that time, the younger generation, the audience was not to wait, um, that there's no good time and that, um, you know, things you'll, you'll have your child and then you'll be able to carry on with your career. Um, and so, just, I, I always, that always really stuck with me. And um, so that's why I had one child during residency and one during fellowship and started my faculty position with a six week old and, you know, it all worked out. All right, great. I was just typing some answers, uh, but very good. Um, I will say, well, first, first I, I, I don't love the wording of like only one thing or only another. So I think when you say only MD, only PhD, that wording diminishes the sort of the excellence of either of those degrees. Uh, and it, it's it's true that most physician scientists in this country are quote unquote MD only, right? So most people doing basic uh, translational research do not have a PhD uh, who are MDs, right? So MD PhD is still an endangered species, is very rare, and that's a lot of what we work on at APSA. Um, so uh, financially, it's very clear that um, that MDs fare better financially in the long run, right? So doing an MD, uh, having however much debt you have, 200, 300, whatever it is, um, financially works out in your favor for the long run, especially if you work at an institution um, that's nonprofit and you are um, subject to the public service loan forgiveness program, uh, which would forgive your loans after 120 payments or 10 years. So if you're in it for the money, MD PhD is not the way to go. And I tell everyone that. Uh, so this, this, this quote unquote free education is not worth it. Um, if the free part is the part for why you're applying to it. Um, so you should really take that out of your consideration uh, when you're applying to MD PhD, because I think that is by far like the minority reason to go into a dual training program, like by far. Uh, so take that out of your mind. Uh, the reason to go into a dual degree training program is because you're really curious about translational research. You want to be a strong basic scientist and you want that training um, for not only your future medical career because that informs how you think about patients, but also because you're interested in doing some kind of research later on and you want formal training. Uh, doing an MD and then doing a residency and possibly a postdoc, which is a very common route in research, uh, will certainly allow you to get involved in research, but you sort of skipped a lot of steps. And the steps are, you know, proposing a thesis, getting your hands dirty in a lab at a young age, um, um, going to meetings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that that formal training is often short track later on. Uh, and so you can certainly do it. Many people do successfully, but uh, I think um, you don't quite have the same strong research background in that case. Um, I think regarding the the, the personal life planning, uh, again, never a great time to um, to, to plan those things, then I think you have to try to progress in your personal life as best you can in this, uh, at a normal pace. And I wouldn't make any plans necessarily based on your stage and training program, 
um, you know, one of my co-residents um, had two children during residency. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big um, sacrifice on both sides, right? The sacrifice to your neurology training potentially and the sacrifice for your family life. But, but you know, she felt that was a great decision and it worked out wonderfully. Um, she had tremendous support and, you know, she now has three children, the third she had during fellowship. So, um, you know, there's many examples of people successfully having families at many stages of training. And um, you have to sort of find how it might fit in um, during, uh, during this long stretch. Gotcha. Thank you for those answers. And relating to that, we've received um, this question a lot, actually. But what makes a physician scientist with an MD, PhD different than a research scientist with just a PhD or a medical doctor who just does research or not just, but does research? And if you want, we can start with Dr. Felton this time. Sure. So if I understood the question, it was what does um, MD, PhD, how is that different than having an MD and doing research or a PhD, having maybe doing some clinical research? Um, I mean, I guess for me, I, I have, I know many, there are many MDs in my department who are doing very high quality research and have their own lab and have NIH grants. Um, and so you can do research going the MD pathway. Um, and there are many uh, medical schools that offer opportunities for research during medical school. Um, here at University of Wisconsin, we have a, a summer program that many of the students participate in, and you can even um, graduate with like a special distinction in research. Um, so there are opportunities for very motivated um, people who want to do medical school and, you know, without the PhD, but still do research. For me, having the training in both allowed me for the PhD part to get really fundamental, you know, years of training in how to do research, how does a lab run, um, how to write a grant, how to write a paper, and having um, dedicated, um, you know, years of time to really learn and understand that. And then um, also doing medical school allowed me to really understand medicine very well so that then I can kind of ask those, you know, integrated questions and be able to have the toolbox to um, take questions from the clinic to the lab. Um, and so there, there are other pathways to doing that, but I feel for me, um, doing the dual degree was the best way to get the most amount of training in both areas um, to be successful. I'll, I'll, I'll just piggyback on, on that answer, if that's okay. Um, I think it's time in, right? Like, you know, we invested the time in becoming scientists and learning sort of that craft and that ask questions in our PhD time. Um, and the MDs that are able to successfully navigate research down the line and run their own labs and or clinical research, et cetera, they spend time learning it. So either you learn it as a PhD student or you learn it later as a postdoctoral a fellow during fellowship research time. Um, so, but you need that time in for you to be able to develop as a scientist. Um, there's no shortcuts to it, unfortunately. You know, um, one, one sort of potential disadvantage that people sort of will, will comment on on the MD-PhD program is that's fragmented. So you'll do MD and then, you know, your research and you go back to the clinicals generally, and then you're doing residency and then you try to go back to research after many years of, of a hiatus. So that's, that is true, it's fragmented to some extent. So then maybe doing it at the other end of it where you're doing a fellowship, everything's sort of more contiguous. So that's one potential benefit to it. Um, I don't know if there's a right way, so it depends on on, on what, you, what you're feeling at the time, right? Yeah. I, I don't have too much to add um, over, um, over what Freddie and Elizabeth already stated. Thank you for your answers. And I believe we have an announcement right now. <laughs> Let's see, it might take a little second. So 
So sorry about that. Alrighty. <laughs> so let me make a quick announcement before we continue. But as a reminder, this session will be recorded and a team of co-moderators are gathering submission questions, which is where I'm actually pulling these questions from. And these come from the registration link and in real time, the chat box, Twitter, and the virtual content committee email. You will also continue to have access to an FAQ document produced by the ND PhD director panelists that we are posting in this chat. But alrighty. Uh, so our next question we have is, can MD, PhD students choose any specialty or is it best to go into certain specialties? Uh, Dr. Feldman, you can go first as well this time if you'd like. Sure. Is that question about like uh, medical specialty, I assume? Yes. Oh. I'll take it that way. Okay. Um, you can choose any specialty. So the residency um, duration ranges from about three to seven years. On the three-year end is internal medicine, pediatrics, family medicine. On the seven-year end, uh, neurosurgery. However, many people do a fellowship after that residency program. So for example, neurology was four years, and then I did a two-year epilepsy fellowship. So it was six years total. And um, I, I think that I personally know um, MSTP graduates who have gone into the range of the specialties. Um, sometimes there are decisions made based on duration of the postgraduate training. Um, you know, so some people may not want to do a seven-year neurosurgery residency and then fellowship. Um, they may want to do something shorter, but um, I think it's important uh, to do what you love and what you're passionate about because this is going to be part of your career. Um, and many people choose their specialty based on their research interests as well. And so that often is a factor in it, um, especially if there's an interest in continuing that research and or doing clinical or translational research. Um, it often makes sense to go into a particular area. And so I would say that many MSTP trainees, by the time it's, you know, sort of time to start uh, applying, are very clear on what specialty they want to go into. Uh, yeah, okay, I can go. Yeah, I, I agree with Elizabeth that um, any specialty will work. Uh, and I think Nowadays, there's even you know more unusual specialties to go into that are classically you know MD PhD associated. You know the most common ones, um, at least from APSIS perspective, that we've uh, found are internal medicine, pediatrics, pathology, um, surgery, neurology. Um, yeah, and uh, and um, and rad onc uh, are, are kind of like the six most common specialties. But you know. Um, Many other specialties that haven't traditionally had as much translational research, I think, are really finding that physician scientists can ask the important questions and um, can address a lot of shortcomings in terms of advancements in the field. So I think it's in everyone's best interest to think creatively and don't think that just because you're not one of the sort of common interested people, like you don't want to do cancer research or you don't want to do something in the brain or, you, you know, that that's not important. Uh, there are a lot of questions to ask in many specialties and actually to be honest if you're looking at nih funding and you know freddie knows this it's probably a lot easier to not be in one of those specialties <laughs> in terms of funding pay lines because for example like the pay lines at like, the national eye institute or even you know dermatological institutes are, are much 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 better than nci dental. yeah dental right so yeah even dental so um in some ways, distinguishing yourself by being a little unusual might be very helpful to you in the long run in terms of grant funding. So keep that in mind as well. Nothing to add. Thank you guys. That was such a new perspective, especially about choosing which specialty to go into. Um, so what would you guys say is the most meaningful part of your work? And Dr. Now you can start, uh, start us off if you'd like. Um, that's a good question. I think I think the I think the most a tie for the most meaningful aspect of my work is taking care of patients and mentoring. I think I find that to be uh, very meaningful. I like teaching. I like um, instructing kind of the next generation of, of physicians, of educators, of scientists. Uh, and so I do that with a lot of the things that I do, both in lab and the educational curriculum. 
and I find a lot of enjoyment out of uh, talking to patients. So though I enjoy the research, uh, of course, I think it's not always fulfilling to me uh, personally because uh, I get, get results and I, and I have findings, but I think most of the fulfillment is actually like some of the other aspects of the science that I do. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think my answer will be pretty similar to what you just heard. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, I do ketogenic diet for adults with epilepsy, which is not very commonly offered. And uh, there's about 15 uh, places in the country where you can go to have that for adults. It's for, pretty common for children. And so many of the patients I see, this is like the first time they're hearing about it. And for the ones that it works for, you know, they're, it's just, you know, it's just very fulfilling, you know, just the, the feedback that I get from the patients and seeing them be able to go from being on disability due to, due to their seizures to being able to work and drive and, and have and just be much happier. So I love that part of my job. And then, um, the you know, we just heard about mentoring. So I um, uh, am faculty director for a MSTP Summer Scholars Program, which is for undergraduates who are interested in the M MSTP pathway, um, who are either from underrepresented backgrounds or um, at institutions that don't have, um, you know, as many research opportunities to be able to come here to, to University of Wisconsin to do a summer research opportunity where we also do um, a variety of other activities. And I just love that. And I think just I was uh, myself um, did many summer programs when I was in undergrad and even back into high school. And um, I appreciate that I'm able to give back now. So I, I love that. I think data across the board here. Um, you know, mentoring uh, trainees in the lab, I think is super fun. Um, you know, one sort of example is a student that came in as a post -bac that, you know, was in, claimed to be interested in the combined degree program, but like you can kind of tell, right? Like usually you're like, oh, okay, like you're, you're, you're here to check the box, or at least that's what I thought initially, but like at the six month mark, he turned it on and it was so cool to see it where like, you know, I would ask him, all right, so what are you doing? You know, what's the next set of experiments? Um, and whereas early on, it would be blank stares um, by the six month mark, he was like mapping out the next like three or four days worth of experiments and what to do based on the particular result that, that could occur. Super gratifying. Now he's a PhD student in my lab. Right. So like completely, you know, uh, blew me out of the water when it came to that. Um, so that's that's one of the most fun things. And then obviously on the clinical side, just the patient interaction and that's sort of uh, the one on one. I mean, you're interacting with patients who are, who are incredibly vulnerable and, and you know, you're, you're meeting them at a, a very um, um, unfortunate time usually. But you can try to sort of usher them through that. Um, so it's not as not as bad as maybe it otherwise could be. Thank you so much. That was great. And how did you, uh, how did your research focus evolve throughout your career? And did you end up staying in the one field that you did your PhD in or did you change it? Oh, I guess I can start there. Um, well, I'll say most MD PhDs don't do the research that they do during MD PhD training or the clinical field that they may have gone into it thinking. Um, so I caution students, don't worry so much about trying to plan everything out on day one of medical school and graduate school, because you often won't exactly know what you want to do. And that's okay, uh, because a lot of the techniques and what you learn during your graduate training, you can apply to many different disciplines. Uh, and so uh, as long as you have a strong foundation in actually how to do research, that's more important than actually what research you are doing. And I think that's kind of a misconception of students that they get enter these programs. So the how is much more important than the what. Uh, that being said, my my research and my clinical interests have matched all the way throughout my training. <laughs> uh, but but that's like highly, highly unusual. Uh, I just happened to be one of these early differentiated people. So in undergrad, I was a neuroscience major. I did cancer research in a couple of summers. I did neuroscience research in a couple of summers. And then I got my degree in biomedical neuroscience working on brain tumor metabolism. And that I then became a neuro-oncologist and I work on brain tumor metabolism. Uh, but most of the time it doesn't match like that. And don't, don't stress yourself out about it because it's very difficult to predict what your interests are. And when you go to your clinical clerkships in medical school, you could 
go in thinking, oh, I want to do one thing, but then you actually see the day to day and what a surgeon does or what an OB guy does and a dermatologist does, and it just doesn't mesh with you. And that's okay because you can switch your clinical interests and you can apply your research principles to whatever specialty you choose. It's just important and to do it right the first time and learn the techniques so that you're a really strong candidate for whatever career you want to go into after you finish um, dual degree training. Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier that I what I did for my PhD and what I'm doing now is quite different, but the, I don't regret anything and my, the skills that I learned are really important. And um, you know, I, I think that that is pretty common, like you've just heard. Um, in terms of specialty, I was pretty sure I wanted to do neurology because it kind of related to the research that I was doing at the time. But I was one of those people when I went on my clinical clerkships, I loved everything. And then in the end, had to really think like, you know, well, what am I going to do? I like everything. How do I decide? And um, ultimately, you know, went with my original, which was neurology. And I've been very happy about that. But then the subspecialty that I went into initially, I thought I was going to do a different neurology subspecialty. But when I got into residency and, you know, kind of went through some of my rotations, I realized that I was much more drawn to epilepsy and some of the research questions there. And, um, you know, it was still early enough within my residency that it was no problem to switch gears. And so I think just kind of keeping an open mind as you go along, um, not to be too unfocused, but to allow yourself to, um, you know, just keeping an open mind to different um, opportunities and different things, I think is is really important and not get too like um, narrow in your in your thinking of your pathway. Um, I'm, I guess like I've been, uh, I've been kind of doing the same thing more or less. Um, I was by engineering chemistry initially, so I wanted to apply this. So basically I went to synthesize a drug, test it in the lab in vitro and then in cells and then test the thing in, in animal models. Um, and that's what I did <laughs> during my PhD in cancer pharmacology, PhD, um, and we actually used proteins and or polymers that were targeted to tumors to deliver cytotoxic uh, radioisotopes, alpha particle emitters. So I did that, you know, as like I said, as a grad student, and I do that now. <laughs> uh, I wasn't planning on continuing doing it, but it turned out that, um, you know, still interested in it. And, you know, we expanded a little bit beyond that, but um, fundamentally, it's, it's very much the same. One, one advantage that I've found is that you know, I've been in the field for 15 years, <laughs> even though I just started my faculty position, you know, a, a few years ago. Um, so uh, it, it is it is helpful because you kind of know all, all the, the, the major players. So it's been beneficial in, in that end. Um, yeah. That really is great to know that even with you guys all being in different, um, different careers sort of in this one career, you're able to do so much and you're not limited by just whatever you major in or whatever you choose to study when you're younger, but yeah. And then what are the job prospects of a physician scientist and where did you find that most of your colleagues ended up? And Dr. Scorcia, if you'd like to start us off, you can. Uh, we're all over the place, right? I mean, it sort of depends on what your specialty is. And that'll be the thing that probably drives, you know, most things, unless you're exclusively lab. So if you're not seeing patients or you don't have any clinical practice, and some some of us uh, chose that. Um, but the, the ones that are going to be seeing patients and trying to run a lab in, um, in sort of an academic center, um, uh, it, it, the, the specialty kind of drives it. And so whether or not the specialty themselves uh, support the, the research side, it's expensive to support you, right? You, you need money to um, run a lab, you need the money to be able to have the supplies to, and money to pay people to come do the work, right? Uh, and beyond that, if you think about it, you know, you bring in money as a physician, right? So you're not seeing as many patients as your colleagues who are full-time clinicians. So um, these are considerations, the financial considerations that department chairs have to sort of take into account. Um, but we're all over the place. Uh, uh, you know, my classes uh, kind of split all across the board. Some folks are mostly focusing on um, clinical, cl you know, prior practice is what they do. They see patients, that's, that, that's their, their, where their sort of passion lies, They're not really involved in the research side. Um, you have other folks that are mostly clinical and academics and doing some, some research, more um, skewing clinical research. 
Other folks are running their own groups. Um, some folks are, you know, dry labs and computational things like that. It's all over the place, right? And some people went uh, into venture capital, right? So it's it's a, it's all over the place. The, the training is very versatile. It teaches, you know, PhD is, is a degree in how to think and tackle problems, right? Um, so I think you can definitely apply that across multiple domains. Uh, and MDs, and, and that's a that's a very unique skill set that you know not everybody gets exposure to. So um, it, it 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 comes in high demand in, in other in other specialties, rather in other uh, um, fields um, when when you when you bring that to the table. So it's all over the place. <laughs> Agree. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just add to that. Uh, because we've done some of these sessions for AFSA in the past, alternative career paths, you have FDA, um, CDC, consulting, obviously industry, um, private practice, uh, regu other regulatory agencies. So I think you should think broadly because academia is not for everyone. And there's a lot of strong things to be said about other career paths. Uh, and that, that switch to a different career path after a dual degree can either happen immediately after the dual degree or after residency. And that's a very big decision to make as well, um, because for some of those paths, having clinical expertise is not required or actually having the ability to prescribe medications and be licensed, let's say, uh, meaning the basic medical knowledge you get in medical school is enough. But for others, you may either want to have the ability to understand issues pertinent to patients, which you really only get as a resident, or and or the ability to be a practicing clinician, which really you also only get from being a resident because you uh, sort of can't practice medicine unless you have like basic internship uh, in general. Uh, so those are considerations that a lot of people often ask about, they, you know, they don't wanna go, they don't wanna be a practicing clinician later on in life, should they still do a residency? And um, I think there's valid arguments on both sides of that for doing residency or not. All right, sweet, thank you. And we have one more, or we have time for just one more question. So what do you think, or what would you say kept you motivated during the long training process? And what advice do you have for the applicants? So, all right, I can't go first here. I I think um, I saw that a lot of those questions, uh, just take it one stage at a time, okay? It's, it's very overwhelming to think when you're, let's say, you know, 21, 22, finishing undergrad that you might have like 15 years ahead of you until you're like, and this is a professor or instructor, that don't think that that way, that's not gonna help anyone. Um, you know, think, you know, I'm gonna apply to a medical school, I'm gonna apply to a dual degree or another type of program. And, you know, one year at a time, you know, you get in, you get your feet wet, Sorry, that's my cuckoo clock. Um, so uh, think one step at a time. I think that's one way not to get overwhelmed. And in terms of motivation, I think you have to really enjoy the path. Like you can't, you can't say like, oh, I'm going through this because I'm, I'm going to be happy in the end. It's not, it's not like an end justify the means. You have to enjoy the means, and so you have to enjoy like being first of all being a student. Uh, so you have to be someone who like really yearns for learning and enjoys that process because you're gonna be in school for a long time. So if you don't like being a student, not, not the path for you, right? If you wanna be a leader and you're someone who, who, who likes to be on top, it's gonna to take you a long time to get there. And if you're not comfortable being a junior person who receives orders or who receives directives or is training under a mentor, and you're someone who's like, a, you know, kind of a more of a free spirit, that's not gonna be a great path for you. Um, so I think you have to enjoy the path. You have to take um, take pride in that. And also the achievements that you're gonna take, you have to be someone who likes deferred rewards, right? Because things take a long time. It takes a long time to get a paper. It takes a long time to get a good result. Uh, it takes a long time to learn everything you need over the, over the course. And so I think I would use that as motivation. I agree. And I won't reiterate what was already stated, but um, just add that having um, support good support network helps. Um, so I have really close friends still to this day um, from actually each phase. So I have um, a group of friends from med school, a group of friends from PhD, and a group of friends from the MSTP. And there's some overlap in there, but not completely. And, um, you know, those groups of friends kind of like we went through this together and, you know, we got each, you know, we had fun, you know, we did fun things, social things. And, 
um, also supported each other through the ups and downs um, that are going to happen. It's not all roses every day during um, any phase of the training. And you need, um, I feel like having just a good support network or people that are going to cheer you on, you know, and I mean, like just being transparent, you know, like coming from like a underrepresented background, you know, there were things that were hard about it. Um, you know, so like my dad would always be like, when are you going to be done with school? When are you going to be done with school? You know, like he was not of the mindset of somebody going to school for so long. <laughs> um, and I don't know if he ever, he was super proud of me, but I don't know if he ever quite got like, <laughs> you know, what exactly I was doing, you know, and that's okay. You know, that's okay too. Um, but he sure was there on graduation day, you know, like <laughs> cheering me on. And so um, I think that, you know, that to say that like people around you may not always understand what you're doing, um, but as long as you know that this is the right path for you and you're that you're kind of going to persevere through it, I think that's what's really important. Yeah, I mean, you got to enjoy the ride. I mean, if you don't like being in the lab or doing the research side, the, it's going to be a brutal four or five years, right? You got to enjoy some aspects of it. Nothing is perfect the entire way through. There's going to be some ups and downs no matter what. Um, you got to find your people, right? Like that's how you sort of commiserate, you break bread, you sort of exchange your, your experiences and you may learn from each other. Somebody may have figured out something that you wouldn't have otherwise uh, known about or maybe you would have figured out eventually, but they already did it, right? So you, you compare notes and you sort of um, help each other out. And, and finding that, that cohort makes it a lot easier. In fact, I'm incredibly lucky because four, four no, so three, so that's four. Well, if you count the PhD people, I live like within 15 minutes of a bunch of my colleagues. Um, three of us were MD PhDs. Two of us did MD PhDs in the same lab, right? He lives down the road. I can like walk to his house. It's like, takes me 20 minutes. Right, it's it's dumb. That never happens. I mean, we can talk to other colleagues. It just never happens. But these are the folks that were my friends at the time, and they're still my friends. They have kids now. Our kids play together, which is a mind job. It's it's the people, right? So you got to find the right mentors to like when you're in the lab. You got to find the right people who are mentors on the clinical side. See where where people are people who are ahead and like, yo, how'd you do this? Right? You you need you need that that guidance. Um, but like, like Evan said, you can't just take the entire 15 year arc and be like, oh, okay, how am I going to get over there? 15 years is a long time. And it's incremental each year. You get a little closer to that. You have the, the tools that you need to, to, to be successful at that stage. Um, so, you know, ask yourself, like, you know, do I, do I like this? Could I do this for the next sort of phase rather than trying to take a big bite of the entire, you know, multi-year affair? <laughs> Alrighty, so thank you guys. That is about time. And I just want to say thank you all for joining us for our Q&A session today with our current students. I want to send a big, a big thank you to our panelists for their time, to the participants who made this session interactive, and to so many people that put these sessions together, including the APSA Diversity Ad Hoc, PR, JEDI, Partnership Committees, uh, Gabby, and APSA Leadership. This session is recorded and will be on our YouTube page, and we are currently in the process of planning our calendar for our upcoming interactive sessions. Stay tuned via social media and look out for emails. I hope you guys have a great evening. Thank you guys so much again. Okay, bye. Have a nice day. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.